All right, well, thank you for coming out here on a beautiful uh, January uh, Sunday before Martin Luther King Day tomorrow and the inauguration on Friday. We've got a lot going on, don't we, in our country here? So I'm really honored to uh, be here. It's my first time at your library. Debbie gave me the history. It's been around since 94 and was remodeled in 2008, I believe. Debbie's been here about 20 years. Do you know Debbie Johnson? Everybody knows, okay, it's a small town. I, I live in Southfield, but I grew up in Detroit, but I'm, I'm very familiar with Ann Arbor because I went there for my undergraduate and my graduate master's in social work programs, so I've lived in Ann Arbor many years, but it's been 20 years since I've lived here, but I still come back, but I have not gotten to know your beautiful town of Saline very much, and I'm hoping to have a little time to drive downtown after the presentation and take a little look, bring my wife back. I have been doing these presentations for about five years, actually, and they've really been building steam in the last even six months. I, I, it was my wife's idea, idea, and she would be here with me today. She loves libraries, as do I, and uh, she loves hearing this topic until I show the video, <laughs> which is a 20-minute documentary in the middle of my presentation because she grew up with a mom and dad who had hoarding issues, and it's still a little difficult to watch. It's not an extremely disturbing uh, video or anything, but um, it's a little hard for her. Um, but um, I'm glad I'm here, and in the last six months I've been in, getting calls all around the state to come to libraries. I'm going to probably do something in the UP uh, in uh, June, and, um, but I've, I, I was just in Boyne up north in the northwest corner of the Lower Peninsula. Uh, I was near Al in Allendale Public Library about a week ago, right near Grand Rapids. So the word is getting out because of wonderful librarians who've seen the presentation, and we've been getting good crowds. We've got about 15 to 20 people we're expecting today. But I've had, um, in Metro Detroit, I've had as many as 70 people fill up a room. I did one in Troy, Michigan, in Oakland County like uh, a month and a half ago, and there were, it was standing room only. So there must be something about this topic that people are really interested in. The way I, I like to run these is mainly to be informational, and obviously we've only got an hour and a half, a little less now, to, to kind of do 101, hoarding 101. But I also want to create a safe and comfortable place for people to ask any question. We want to have a sensitive, non-judgmental kind of atmosphere here. If there's any humor, we mean it in good spirit because sometimes human behavior can be curious and sometimes even funny in a way, but we want to have a lot of respect here and a lot of safety. So there may be a few points in the, in the program today where somebody wants to divulge something. I might ask questions of the audience. You have no obligation to, to talk or answer anything, but sometimes what I found is people are going to share a little bit either about themselves or their loved ones. So I, I want everybody to keep confidentiality. I know this is not group therapy, but I don't know how close-knit you are, but I'd, I'd hate to have anybody kind of leave the program today and then go spread the word. And they guess who was at the hoarding seminar? Guess who said they're a hoarder? Guess whose mom's a hoarder? I trust you all to have common decency. Uh, not that there's anything wrong. We all have a lot of disorders, right? But let's just keep it uh, safe here so people can feel more comfortable. Are most of you from the greater Saline area? Okay, <laughs> okay. And also what I'm going to do too, um, I thought I brought them with me, but I have a schedule on a sheet of paper of all the upcoming uh, similar presentations I'm giving, all free talks around the state, uh, you know, from, from next week all the way up until June. I did not bring that, but what I'm going to try to do, and Debbie, I don't know if you can help me, you can either email me and I'll email it to you if you've got my contact information, or maybe during the break, if I remember, I can email you it, the, the, the document, and maybe even before the end of the day you can put them out. I will do my best to remember it. I'm usually pretty good about that. Welcome. Welcome, too. So um, let's get going. And um, if at any point you have a burning question, uh, just raise your hand. But you're going to have ample time. I'm going to ask you different questions. And we want to get through the material and the 20-minute documentary that I'm going to hopefully plop right in the middle of the 90 minutes. Uh, so if you have something important, raise your hand. I will try to address it, okay? But also realize this is Hoarding 101. We're going to try to understand what it is, what it isn't what contributes to the problem, what causes it, and what are some treatment alternatives and resources. But please use my contact info to either email or call me if you want further information. I will also be here for about five or ten minutes after the presentation if you want to come up privately and ask a quick question or, or make a comment. And I do have a few books for sale, though I did donate my latest book, the 2011 book called Cluttered Lives, Empty Souls, Compulsive Stealing, Spending, and Hoarding. I did donate it to Debbie, so it will be in your circulation here probably within a short time. You can get my books online through Amazon or through me directly, and I do have a few copies of, of all my books up here. If you'd like to purchase one after, they're $20. We accept all forms of payment. That will be my only promotional <laughs> comment, okay? All right, well, let's get moving. 
Oh, and by the way, uh, just so you know, uh, Jacob is over here from uh, local video access. Uh, Jacob, uh, you gave me your card. I could look at it. Wh where are you from exactly? SCTN? Okay. So uh, I think it's somewhat routine that you sometimes film these for educational purposes. So I've okayed it, but I wanted to let you guys know if, if uh, he's not going to be, um, you know, filming anybody's face or anything. So if you're concerned about what is the video doing here, I believe you're going to, are you going to play that on public uh, or access TV or something or? Yeah. So just keep that in mind if you're a little skittish and you may decide you don't want to answer a question or ask a question. That's fine, but I just want to have informed consent if you're uncomfortable about that. But uh, this is not uncommon to have videos, and I'm, I'm grateful that, that they will be having it on local TV where people can get help and information. So how many of you, uh, first of all, what, what room in the house is that? Can people tell? Okay, okay, okay. So there's our little humor. Now, and I know some of you are here for yourselves, some of you are here for loved ones, some of you are here because you had nothing better to do on a Sunday afternoon. But um, has anybody ever been in a kitchen which is, or, or any kind of room in a house that has maybe looked that unusable? None of you? No. Okay. And, and do you mind my asking under what circumstances were you in? Is it your own house? Is it a relative? Or are you a social worker and you came into somebody's home? Or under what circumstances did you see a, a home or a kitchen that maybe looked a little bit like that? I yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I knew it was over there. Okay. All right. And how long ago was that? Okay. Did it alarm you? Were you surprised? No, I wasn't surprised. You weren't, you, you, okay. Yeah, okay. Fine. Anybody else? Okay. So, how many of you watch those TV programs on hoarding? They've been popping up in, in the cable TV programs in the last eight to ten years. There's five or six of them. And these are typically the situations that you see on TV. They're the most extreme examples. And I have been in a couple of homes like that uh, since I've been working with hoarding for about eight or nine years. Um, but it doesn't have to be that bad for it to be a problem. As a matter of fact, those are the most extreme cases. They do exist, but many people I work with, it's nowhere near that bad. This is just a representation of one room, but it could be the living room or what have you. Um, but it can still be a problem. I think we'd all agree, right? Just like, you know, alcohol can be a problem. You've got absolute severe alcoholics who can't function at all, and then I don't really like the term, but we sometimes use it, a functional alcoholic where it could still be causing problems in their relationships, with their health, obviously, at work, and of course, perhaps getting behind the wheel of a car and driving, or what we know is a lot of times people, when we're drinking, we don't always use our best judgment. It could lead to domestic violence or accidents or other kinds of uh, relational problems. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm 51. Uh, I don't know if I look at, I'll turn the light on again, but I turned 51 in June. I'll be 52 in June. I've been married to my sweetheart, Tina, for 14 years. Uh, we are child-free, that's the new term, not child-less, <laughs> child-free, though we do have a dog and a couple fish. Uh, I love my dog, Bam Bam. Um, and I am a U of M grad twice over, um, and in between my uh, undergrad here at U of M and my MSW, I went to law school in Detroit, Detroit College of Law, which is now Michigan State University College of Law. As Debbie mentioned, I'm a licensed social worker and addiction therapist, now celebrating 20 years. Woo-hoo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've survived. And um, I've worked, sorry about that D there. We now call it, <laughs> we used to call it substance abuse or chemical dependency. We actually now call it substance use disorders. But I've, I worked in that field for the first seven years in Plymouth, Plymouth, Michigan. I had a drug and alcohol clinic, and I really learned a lot there. But I wanted to go out on my own, partly... Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, have more flexibility with my time and a little more creativity. So for the last uh, 13 years or so, I've been self-employed. My wife also helps me to some degree. We're a small shop, but uh, we're in Southfield, but I travel. I also do a lot of my therapy by telephone, Skype, or FaceTime with people because uh, I work with stealing, spending, and hoarding. Those are my three specialties. And most of the people come to me for issues with shoplifting or other forms of theft. Has anybody heard of people who have problems with shoplifting and stealing? They're not all pure criminals, as we might think, but there's a lot of people. As a matter of fact, a few of you in the crowd might be clients of mine one day. But it really can affect a lot of people. And how many of you have ever heard of shopping addiction or shopaholism? Again, we've laughed about it, but in the last 10 to 20 years, I think it's gotten out there that for some people, this is a progressive and chronic problem that is easier said than done to just curtail it. You know, you could have the best financial planner in the world giving you all the best advice, but if you're not ready for change and you've got stuff going on, you're, you're going to continue to shop and spend. That, so about my stealing, uh, 
clients, that, that's a little more than half of what I do. The spending is about a quarter, and then the hoarding might be a little less than a quarter of the work I do. And then I've got these books. And I myself have been in recovery. Do we have any people here who are brave enough to raise their hands? Anybody in recovery from any kind of addictive compulsive disorder? It could be eating, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be codependency. Does anybody uh, consider yourself to be in recovery from any behavioral problem? Am I the only one? Okay, well, I say it loud and proud. My, my particular behavior uh, was shoplifting. So that's kind of how I got interested in, in, in stealing behavior. Um, and I had a bad problem with shoplifting from age 15 to 25. The reason I tell you this is partly because I, I want to create some openness here, because it'll help later. Um, and, and I like to remove the shame and stigma about that. There was a time where I lived a secret life from age 15 to 25 where I was shoplifting, and I didn't want anybody to know, and I didn't tell anybody until I got to a point in my life on the verge of my second, and hopefully final arrest in 1990 as I was in the middle of law school. Yes, I give new meaning to the phrase criminal attorney. <laughs> um, but it's been a magical journey because through getting help, my first real time in therapy at about age 25 in 1990, I began to understand not only what was motivating the shoplifting and regrettably in a sense that I had basically become addicted to it and it wasn't something I could just stop easily. But the good news about that was I, I, I researched it. I, I started a support group in 1992. We're going to be 25 years old. It's called CASA, Kleptomaniacs and Shoplifters Anonymous. And our flagship group is in Southfield, where I live. But little by little, uh, through starting the group, I got interested in, I, I, I did practice as an attorney for a few years. I was fortunate enough to get approved by the bar, even though I had a criminal record. I was really lucky. I mean, I was very honest about it, but I had good letters from a, from a therapist. and I had a, a guy I was law clerking for who was a very reputable attorney in Detroit, and it helped that he was my next door neighbor growing up in Detroit. So he really went to bat for me. He said, look, Terry, what he did was obviously illegal and not good, but he's a good person. He's gotten some help. We're confident that he's not ethically a bad person. And, and they gave me a chance, and they approved me to be a lawyer, and it's exactly 25 years uh, this month since I've been a lawyer. So I've had a lot of blessings, and I started the support group, got interested in going back to become a social worker, and it's been a wonderful journey. You know, the old taking lemons and making lemonade. And maybe some of you can do that in some way. You probably have already in your lives, but maybe even from this uh, presentation today. Okay, so real quick, our goals and objectives as I see them, hopefully they're yours too. We want to define what hoarding is and what it isn't, because a lot of times, like, if you, if you looked at this uh, picture, if you walked into somebody's home, it would be easy for you to go, oh my God, I'm in the presence of a hoarder. Somebody here is a hoarder. That may be true, but there might be other explanations for what's going on. We have to look under the hood. Uh, you know, the old joke is, uh, how do you know an alcoholic? Well, it's anybody who drinks more than I do. <laughs> you know, we have a way of kind of saying things. So a lot of times what looks like hoarding may not be hoarding. It may be, but we need to know more. So we have these other two terms here called cluttering and chronic disorganization, which will kind of compare and contrast to hoarding. I'll just tell you right now, number two, our goal. Uh, I'm not sure we know how many people have hoarding disorder, at least legitimate hoarding disorder. Uh, in the U.S., uh, it's anywhere from 2 to 5 percent is our best guess. I like using the 5 percent, which would be a little over 15 million Americans. Um, but it's probably more than we think because a lot of times it is hidden. Um, or a lot of times we might label it cluttering when it's really something more severe. Uh, I bet you're kind of curious to kind of figure out, well, how do people start this behavior? And like, what, what, what's involved with it? You know? And certainly some people have uh, hoarding traits from very early on in their lives. But many people, it can occur it, gradually, and it can, can spike in middle age. And then I've had a number of clients who have been what we call later onset hoarders, where it, it may happen later in life, where somebody might have been a real neat nick up until now. As a matter of fact, also how I got interested in this topic was not only because I was watching the programs and I'm generally interested in human behavior, but I was finding a lot of my clients who I was working with initially who were stealing, and then secondarily I got into overshopping, overspending, a lot of them were collecting stuff, whether it was, or I say collecting, we'll get to the difference between collecting and hoarding in a moment too, but they were having trouble letting go of the things that they had stolen, whether from work uh, or from a store or things that they bought, whether through the stores, through the TV shopping network, online. But what really brought it home was about eight years ago, I noticed my brother, I'm the oldest of three, my 45-year-old brother, and I just visited him in uh, my 15-year-old nephew last night, um, he, did, he was a real neat neck growing up, but he started about 10 years ago, eh, shortly after his son was born, to, to kind of buy more things for him as he was getting older. And 
it was a joint custody kind of arrangement with the mom, and my brother would get my nephew every weekend, and I'd come over as much as I could, and he'd always have a gift for him. But then one gift became two gifts. And every November 25th, when my nephew's birthday would come along, we'd have a family birthday party over at Jeepers or Chuck E. Cheese or someplace out, and everybody would bring one gift for Devin. And my brother would literally need one of those shopping carts at the front of the store to bring to his car, and he'd unload 25 gifts. It was quite a spectacle. And little by little, it, you know, it was hard to find a place to sit in his living room. There was so much stuff. And then the capper was, I remember it like clear as a bell. About eight years ago, I'm watching my nephew on a Friday night. My brother was out with a girlfriend that night, and I innocently enough went to the refrigerator to get something to drink. And what do you think I saw in the refrigerator? No, 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 no bodies. <laughs> um, but it was, it, was, it was filled to the brim. And, and, and I, I, I gingerly opened up the freezer, and good thing I did because I had to duck because things came sliding up. I would, I would have been decapitated. I would not have been here today. My <laughs> but it was, and I, what do you think I did next? <laughs> well, yeah, I said to Devin, I, I, I said to my nephew, I'm going to take about an hour. Uh, Devin, are you okay? Uncle Terry is going to do a little project in the kitchen. And I cleaned out my brother's fridge and his freezer. And I had about, you know, one of those huge, like the hugest hefty, black hefty garbage bag you could imagine. It was like a Santa Claus bag. I don't know, I found it in an empty bag, and I, I filled it up with all kinds of stuff. And still, there was plenty in the free, I, I threw out empty hot sauce bottles, moldy cheese. I threw out 500 McDonald's ketchup packets. I left another 500 in the drawer. Uh, mystery meat, you name it, freezer burn stuff. And I'm feeling all good about myself. After about an hour, I clean it down, wipe it down, and then, you know, I'm start, I have to admit, I'm starting to feel a little anxious as I'm realizing my brother's going to be home soon. But he got home, and I'm just kind of waiting to see, you know, if he's going to go in the kitchen. And he goes in and opens up the refrigerator, apparently, and what do you think he said? Nothing. Who in the hell? <laughs> yeah, 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 except we're going to substitute hell with the word, and I'll tell you what, it begins with F and it ends with K. Okay. <laughs> And I was shaking my, sh I come in, and I'm like kind of, kind of shaking now, and I'm kind of, you know, uh, a little bit nervous and uh, embarrassed and, you know, confused, you know, why he's so angry. And, um, and, 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 and I said, well, I went to get a drink, and it, you know, it was frankly disgusting, and I, I, I thought I'd help you out. And, and what do you think you said next? Don't touch my stuff. Well, that's what came after that, but then what, what, what before that? Where's, where's the stuff? And I said, it's over here. And I tell you, I was going to actually schluck it over into the uh, dumpster in the apartment complex uh, parking lot. But for some reason, I just left it there. What do you think happened next? He started to put it all back. And that's when I had one of those, like, almost an out-of-body experience where I said, and I won't swear, but I, I said an expletive, like to myself. And, and all of a sudden, it, it became clear my brother was a hoarder. And he, like, uh, he was mentally ill. I, 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 this is not normal. I mean, I admit what I did was wrong, but, you know, so I'm, I'm watching him. And that was, I was already interested in hoarding, but that put me over the top. I said, I got I to gotta learn about this and understand it. This is like, now the good news is my brother did get a little bit of treatment and through his own efforts has really improved upon it. He still is a bit of a clutter bug, and I don't think the hoarding instinct is going to go away. But it's a good example of somebody uh, kind of in the middle of his life and his you know, late 30s, mid 30s, began this behavior um, for whatever reason, maybe because his son was born and there were some changes or one thing led to another. We'll explain why, but, uh, but that's the kind of thing that uh, I often deal with. We'll tell you a little bit about some resources and treatment strategies. There's not a lot out there. I don't mean to be pessimistic, but uh, there used to be a group, and I'm not sure if it still exists. I, I meant to look this up. There, there, a woman started a group in Ann Arbor, and I think it's still going on once a month, actually. It's called Children of Hoarders. Has anybody heard of that? You can look it up. And she was actually on the Anderson Cooper talk show a few years ago. Uh, her name is Elizabeth, and I met her uh, once or twice when I've attended those meetings just to kind of understand what's out there. And uh, she had a mom who was a hoarder, and, and, and Elizabeth herself was deeply affected by her mom's hoarding. It, it, it can be for a child, and like I told you about my wife, my wife grew up with a mom and dad who were both hoarders, products of the Great Depression. We've got some people who might be in that uh, generation. And uh, it was really difficult for her. Um, she never brought friends over because she was embarrassed. She cleaned and cleaned and cleaned, but it would get, you know, messed up again. She would go to school worried that her clothing smelled from the different uh, odors in the house and not a very good way to, and, and, and she developed mild hoarding tendencies, which she really has to keep an eye on. Um, but anyway, we'll talk about that. And, and anything you can do or feel called to do 
whether you yourself may have this problem or think you do or you have a loved one, if there's any way where you could spread the word, maybe you tell somebody uh, about the talk or maybe you have them go to my website or whatever, if you find a way to pass it on to somebody, uh, please do because I'm, uh, I'm only one person, I can only do so much. So what is hoarding? Um, somebody raise your hand if you want, it's optional. Don't worry about getting it perfect or right, but give me a, a layperson's definition of what hoarding is or describe an element of hoarding or you know, paint a little picture for us if you can. Who wants to take a shot at it? What is hoarding? If you were explaining it to an alien, <laughs> like, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, that's, that's a really good, that's, that's a lot there. Anybody want to add to that? When it interferes with your life. When it interferes with your life. Activities of daily right. Life. Now, yes, and I could be in denial about that, right? <laughs> Just like an alcoholic. I, I think you're an alcoholic. You've got a drinking problem. I don't have a drinking problem. And this often happens. I'm not a, what? You know, so that's part of what we deal with. Um, why is it a mental illness? Because finally, as of about three or four years ago, the psychological community finally recognized it as an illness in itself, a mental illness in itself. And I know a lot of times we don't like saying, I'm mentally ill. Now remember, people can live with mental illnesses. I have a history of family depression. It's managed through medication and therapy and keeping an eye on things. But I, I have mental illness in my family and in my own history. I'm a recovering addict. You know, I was shoplifting. I was mentally ill. You know, so uh, there's a big stigma just about mental illness. But yeah, it is legitimately a mental illness because it is characterized, as many mental illnesses are, by distortions of thought. So if I have like a psychosis or schizophrenia, I might be hearing voices or seeing things or being paranoid, right? If I, um, if I have the disease of alcoholism, I may be feeling very sincerely like I can't live without a drink. Um, and I might be thinking that you're out to get me because you're trying to take my alcohol away and all kinds of other things, right? Or if I have an anxiety disorder, I might really be very anxious about like going in public or, or speaking to people in public, which is, you know, that's a whole other thing, right, public speaking. But so as you said, and you said, um, the typical thought disorders or thought um, distortions that hoarding people have, and usually it's gradual, is that I have this uh, unhealthy, dysfunctional attachment with things. Now, there's nothing wrong with attachment to things. We all have attachment to things on some level. But it's the degree to which, in, in, in my, my, my thinking, truly my thinking and my feeling that everything has a potential use or value. Everything. So the typical hoarder won't throw away or, or anything. I mean, generally speaking, with some exceptions, right? And, and that that stuff is so important that if I don't have it, or somebody removes it, or I throw it away, something really terrible is going to happen. I'm certainly going to feel terrible. Yes, you might feel terrible for a while. So it, it really interferes with life. And a lot of times, you know how we sometimes uh, say with a real, an alcohol relationship, like, you're choosing the bottle over me and the kids. And frankly, I come from an alcoholic home where that's what my mom ended up probably saying to my dad before she ended up having to divorce him because his alcoholism was getting so bad, and I'm sure she felt that if she didn't say it. Well, the same thing can often be said with people who hoard. You're, you're choosing stuff over us, or, or over your health, or over the safety of our home. So do you see how that could be a mental illness? Okay, so all right, um, real, real quick game here. There's a, I, you probably know already, I'm pretty loose in the way I present. There's a politically incorrect uh, humorous called Jeff Foxworthy, I don't know if you know, but. I'm not a big fan, but he does this routine called, you might be a redneck if, <laughs> you know what a redneck is. Are there any rednecks in the crowd? All right, we're going to edit this part out, Jacob. But he does this thing like, you might be a redneck if, and then he has a funny line. So I actually adapted that here. So we've talked about hoarding, but let's play this little game, kind of like, so you might be a hoarder if, and you guys, one at a time, maybe fill in the blank. Like, what, what, if you walked into a home, what might you see that might at least get you questioning, is this hoarding? You might be a hoarder if... Give an example of a... You newspapers from 1950. <laughs> okay, right. You might be. You have a lot of newspapers or magazines that are outdated. Yes, you might be a hoarder if... You can't walk from the front door into your bedroom. 
Right, there, it might be blocked or there might be these big piles or trails. They sometimes refer to them as goat trails, which is not a great term, but you know how those billy goats go up the mountain, they go this way until they find the path of least resistance. You might be a hoarder if. Right, like that, pit. yeah, or there's nowhere to sit at the dining room table. Now, it could just be cluttering, which is, we'll get to that in a minute, but right, or you might not be able to sleep on the bed. You might not be able to use the bathroom. A big one, you might not be able to use the garage to park your cars in these winters because, okay, now I'm hitting home. I saw a few uncomfortable looks here. So, you might be, the, you might be a hoarder if, anybody else? Your house smells like a garbage can, right. You might be a hoarder if the shades are always drawn, even in the beautiful sunlight of day because you're, you know, you don't want anybody to look in, you're embarrassed. You might be a hoarder if your family members say, we love you, mom, but we're not coming over, bringing the grandkids. It's just, you know, we can't visit anymore. It's unsafe and it's not pleasant. You might be a hoarder if You bring in, but nothing goes out. And not to be uh, kind of gross, but it's kind of like if you take food into your body and you never eliminate it, <laughs> it's kind of like that. And there's active hoarding, bringing in like things that might not be necessary. You think, get things from the side of the road, or you go to every garage sale, you know you're not even gonna use this stuff. But even passive hoarding, meaning if you just do not relinquish the things that come into our lives in the normal course of living, that could be newspapers and magazines, it could be packaging material, it could be uh, junk mail, it could be kitty litter, it could be food, it could be recycling uh, materials. It, it, you know, it does not take long for that to pile up, does it? My wife and I live in a modest condo and uh, we're, we have three green recycling bins that go out every Tuesday morning. Our trash gets picked up twice a week and we have Goodwill or Veterans of America come to our door to get donations twice a month routinely. And we're not even super consumers and we don't have kids. You know, so, all right, you, you guys are getting there. So what's cluttering? We all hear that term, clutter bug. What do you think the difference is between cluttering and hoarding? Generally speaking, yes, that's one. What else? What's the difference perhaps between cluttering and hoarding? Right, they want to, they want to change, they're just having trouble doing it. It's like, I might be overweight, but I, I need help. That's where personal trainers can come in, or Weight Watchers could come in. I know I have a problem or whatever, but my brain doesn't work in the way, at least not very easily, where I can't do it without help. Um, what else? Are, are you saying so like they need a system? Pro generally speaking, or they either hire somebody or they learn how to do it themselves, yes. Generally, cluttering is confined to maybe one or several areas, but not usually the whole area. Um, that would be one. How about the attachment to the stuff? Is there a difference, do you think, between a clutterer and a hoarder? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. What's the difference? It's not an emotional attachment. To generally speaking, not. Now, nobody likes somebody touching their stuff. I mean, even if it's cluttered, generally speaking. I mean, maybe some people, thank you, honey, for taking care of that for me. Some people can work that out. Usually people with hoarding, and this is one of the tell marks, don't touch my stuff, don't move my stuff. There's an obstinance about it, almost a paranoia about it, at least in the more advanced stages, right. How about now, you've heard this term, has anybody heard the term chronic disorganization? So have you heard of professional organizers? Yeah. So partly because of cluttering, partly because I think we all have more stuff than we used to, I can't speak for everybody, but you know, it, like the old joke was, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a hoarder, uh, the problem is my home is too small. <laughs> so you get a bigger home. And then guess what? When that home gets filled up, then what? You either get a bigger home or guess who invented, well, I wouldn't say invented, what if storage units. The storage unit industry. Now, I'm 51, growing up, I don't remember any of those places, maybe one here or there, and I figured those were for extreme or unusual <laughs> examples, you know. Um, now they're on almost every corner, right? Do you guys have storage units? Uh, in, it's, I, I keep forgetting the figure, but it's, it's in the tens of billions of dollars, the industry. Uh, I forget if it's 40 billion or 80 billion, but it's a huge amount that, now there are some legitimate, I'm not saying that everybody who has a storage unit is a hoarder. You have to look under the hood and ask more questions. But it's safe to say that they saw a need, that we were running out of space. And uh, it is one thing you want to look for. It does not always mean, but a lot of people that I know um, who are hoarders have storage units. It's 
matter of fact, I was hired by a middle-aged couple in, in Metro Detroit a few years ago, and the, <laughs> the, the gentleman made a mistake of asking his wife one year, what would you like for Christmas? And she says, for you to get help with your hoarding. And he took her up on it, and she went online and found me. The thing, I think she'd come to one of my talks, and I worked with him for a while. Uh, not terribly successfully, uh, to be quite frank, but um, I came to their house, and I'm looking around, and I'm going, uh, and I met with Bill, I said, um, uh, this looks pretty clean. What do, you know, where's, where, where's the body? <laughs> and she says, well, you haven't been down our basement yet, and you, we also have, well, not we, but my husband has four storage units a mile and a half down the road that are costing us a lot of money rent. Oh, oh, and on top of it, my mom died a couple years ago. I wanted to sell her home or at least rent it out. He's using that as a glorified storage unit as well. Yeah. I mean, this is real stuff. So you could tell there was a lot of conflict in the relationship. Um, so, but chronic disorganization is cluttering plus time. It's chronic cluttering and often to the point where it's not just messy, but often people, it's really either getting on their own nerves or they're, you know, they're losing things, they're misplacing things, it's taking a lot of time and energy. So like hiring a personal trainer, again, somebody saw a need, maybe there's been professional organizers since the dawn of time, back in the cave days, and people go to organize the cave for you. But now it's a whole industry where people get certified and they're making on average of $50 an hour a decent living and I know a few of them and they're doing quite well and there's a, there's a need for it. Where they really come in and help people like a personal trainer, maybe to get the ball rolling, Maybe teaching them skills about this and that. Maybe you know, thinking outside the box about with containers and different organizational systems. And some people come routinely in like a massage therapist to work with people on a monthly basis just to help them. God bless them, you know, because they do good work. Now, if you get a professional organizer who gets a call and finds out that he or she is dealing with a hoarder, what do you think typically happens? They don't take it or they try to take it and they find out usually very quickly that this is like above their pay grade or over their head. Because again, like with the example of a shopaholic, you could have the best financial, you could, have, you could hire Susie Orman to come in and tell you how to manage your money. But if you're not ready emotionally, and, and while we don't consider hoarding to be exactly an addiction, it's at least a kissing cousin because it really mimics it. It is a gradual progression, sometimes uh, early in life or later in life, sometimes slowly, sometimes rapidly, that gets worse and worse without any kind of intervention or treatment. There's a, it's characterized by denial and, and, and obstinance. I don't need help. I don't need help. Um, it, it interferes with our lives on a great dimension. There often are a variety of emotional issues going on in a person's life that underlie the behavior, just like with an alcoholic. It might be child abuse, unresolved loss, unresolved trauma, low self-esteem, depression, all this kind of stuff. And even when you clean the stuff up, if the person's not recovery-minded, now I'm not saying never. Maybe some people like, you know, just stop drinking completely on, on a dime. There, there are those examples. And some people, they have a big catharsis and their hoarding is dissolved. But for most of us mere mortals, it might be something you've got to keep an eye on because it tends to come back even when you've had success. We look at the dieting industry, if you even want to call it that. So people, you know, many people can lose weight with on their own or with help more often. But if we don't keep it going, you tend to gain the weight back plus more. So there's a high relapse potential. So therefore, uh, you've probably maybe heard these stories. They show them sometimes on TV. So grandma's a hoarder. The family sends her on a trip to Disney World for a week. <laughs> grandma comes back. The family has taken upon themselves in the interim to do her a favor, kind of what I did with my brother in his refrigerator. They clean her house, throw out half of her stuff. What do you think grandma's reaction is? Not very good. As a matter of fact, um, in general, that's what we call an involuntary clean up or clean out. With rare exceptions, we don't advise that. Now, there are times where that may have to happen as a last resort. It's not pretty, but sometimes that's where you get to. Um, the goal of, of, of this work is not to turn people who like stuff or need to have a lot of stuff, not to turn them or their homes into Martha Stewart's home. So that's often what families have in mind. You know, we'd say, oh, I, you know, it might be my issue. I want it neat. Or here's how I, here's how I would judge that it's, it's livable. And it might be way too high a standard. And often the people uh, who are hoarding actually fear that, that you want to take away all my stuff. And sometimes they're actually right because they've had experience with that. And, and, and often we have to go very slow 
And, and just to, I'll say it and I'll say it again later, often, I don't mean to be discouraging, often the best we can do with people who hoard is, is what we call harm reduction. Meaning we start with health and safety and that is our, that is our in. Said, so, you know what, I don't, I'm not expecting to get rid of all your stuff, but I'm tired of living in what I feel is an unclean, unsafe, unhealthy environment. So here's some things that I would like to discuss that will make me feel a little better. You can keep everything down in the basement or whatever, but here's, I don't want the exits blocked. We've got to have things off the floor. I don't want dust and, and insects and vermin or black mold forming. I don't want the things piled near the furnace where it might be a fire hazard. You know, we, you, our neighbors had a flood. You know, the, I don't want all this stuff down. You know, we got to do something. I don't want the exits blocked. I don't want to be tripping over stuff. I don't want things falling on us. You know, Sometimes, not even always, the person with the hoarding might get on board with that as a reasonable request. And then we can maybe work from there uh, and maybe even make more progress. Um, any, any thoughts or questions before we move on? All right, if you change your mind, let me know. Oop. All right, so here's the personal part here. So we already talked to one person here um, who said that you were in the presence of a hoarder's home. Or, how many of you, you know, based on our working definition, so we're distinguishing it from clutter or mere chronic disorganization, which would kind of be in the middle ground between cluttering and hoarding, chronic disorganization. How many of you suspect that you either knew or know currently uh, someone who may have a hoarding problem, even a mild one, based on, you know, interference in one's life, a lot of stuff, difficulty, uh, you know, using, using part of the home for its intended purposes? So a number of hands. All right. How many of you? Here might be a little trickier part, but part of my goal is to remove the shame and stigma and talk openly about this. Uh, sensitively, even though we might have a little hopefully good-natured humor from time to time, we're not laughing at anybody. But how many of you have ever thought that you have struggled maybe even with a mild case of hoarding at any point in your life? Okay, thank you for being here. I, I appreciate that. So that's, that's good, and that, I imagine that's partly why you're here, either to find out more information or here it is the new year, a great time to have this talk. Spring is a good time, spring cleaning. Summer is a good time because you want to open up your shades and let the sun in. Winter is a good time. It's all a good time. Okay, so thank you for raising your hands. We had a few people. So almost anything can be hoarded. Um, uh, you know, there's active accumulation, you know, where you're going out and actively shopping for stuff that might not be terribly necessary. It could, I mean, you know, could be clothes, could be other kinds of things. And then there's just the stuff that comes into our life in the daily thing, in the daily course of life. And most people with hoarding have both. So it doesn't take long between just the <laughs> passive stuff if you don't let go of any of it and things that you're bringing, garage sales, eBay, Craigslist. Oh, the neighbor's moving. They put all their stuff out on the, so you take it in. Or somebody dies. This happens too. Somebody dies and you don't know what to do with their stuff. I have a friend who's, a financial, my, who's the financial advisor and a friend of my wife's and myself. And she's very smart with other people's money and helping them manage it. Not so great with her own. And she's a recovering hoarder. And partly what happened, she was already a bit of a recovering hoarder. Her mom was at least a pack rat. I can't say for sure whether she was a hoarder. But her mom passed away about 15 years ago, around the time my wife and I got married and actually hired this friend as an accountant. And she took all of her mom's stuff in because she couldn't throw any of it out. Now, I can understand initially. And some of us have had that experience, but typically, what, what does the average person typically do with the, the personal effects of a deceased loved one? Well, pardon me? Put it in the basement or the attic. <laughs> Put it in the basement or attic. Well, maybe temporarily, but generally speaking, most people would pick out some of the more valued items, whether monetarily or sentimentally or both or distribute them among other family members, or have an estate sale, or donate them, or things like that, right? Not always, but typically, if you're already a hoarder, you're going to have a difficult time deciding what, so you just sit on it, you procrastinate, or, or you actually feel like to get rid of any of this person's stuff would be insensitive. So I was talking to my friend about, uh, you know, my financial advisor friend, and, and she was saying, yes, I, I, I know intellectually because I said, if your mom saw you doing this and everything, you know, what, what would she say? And, and without missing a beat, my friend said, I know what my mom would say. She'd say, get rid of it. But emotionally, she's not ready yet. Now, she's, I think she's done a little bit over time. Also, she moved around before we met her 15 years ago. She lived in a few different states. And when we, when we, uh, while I was writing my book in 2011, and her interview is in the book because I interviewed her under a different name, but um, she had several storage units across the Southwest where she had lived 
where stuff was, you know, still she was paying rent on it, furniture, paintings, this and that. Hundreds and thousands of dollars going out the drain, you know, every year. I mean, we did the math and, and she said, you know, it was, it was like over $60,000 over a decade that she had spent on storage fees. And this is a financial advisor, my very bright woman. And she goes, I know, if, if I had a client who was doing this like I am, I'd say they're crazy. And it took her a long time. And think about it. After you've sunk all that money into these storage units, this is how they get you. It's like a bad stock. You're waiting for it to come back. You've invested time, energy, and fantasy hope about what you're going to do with it. It's hard to let it go. You feel like a fool. But at some point, as we say, you may have to cut your losses. And that's what she began to do. She had really. And a lot of times what, what happens is these storage unit places, they know that a certain amount of people are going to either not be able to continue paying the rent or are going to just disappear or whatever. And they have all this stuff and they can sell it for whatever. Or sometimes they'll take it off your hands for nickels on the dollar. Not even that. I, I had a client who had three storage units full of stuff and he finally just said, to hell with it. And he asked what kind of money. He got $300 from the storage unit place for all the stuff. And he had spent thousands of dollars on rental fees. So uh, if that's not kind of mentally ill. <laughs> but again, some of us can relate to these things. But almost, almost yeah, go ahead. So what happens with the gentleman or the woman that has the finally said, wow, the, 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 what, what was the key thing that they finally said, oh. You mean the couple I worked with? No, well, no. You oh, this woman. Oh, the woman. $60, yeah, 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 my friend. Well. She, it, the well, here's partly what happened. She started dating a guy, then they moved in together, and that relation, the relationship, it, it forced the issue because now he's involved because they were combining their money a little bit. Mm -hmm. he, he was kind of the opposite. But it took even years after going out and living with him before she finally got to that point. And that's not uncommon, too. Somebody finally gets to the point where, you know, I'm ready to stop drinking or curtail my drinking or get help. So oftentimes it's a very gradual process. I don't know that it was a one kind of thing. It was great. Partly talking to me and working with me helped her, you know, process some things. I was very non-judgmental and just curious about it. So that often happens. But for many people, have you ever heard the term hitting bottom or getting a wake-up call? So for an alcoholic, it might be a drunk driving. Or for another alcoholic, it might be the tenth drunk driving that does it. Uh, or it might be threat of a divorce, or after several divorces, or lo losing a job, or being told that your liver is shot, you know, and then still drinking on it and finding out that you can't hold it and you're sick. Everybody is different. And, and not to be uh, negative, but the sad truth is, this both from um, research and <clears throat> personal experience, and professional experience, most people are going to live their entire lives never admitting to a problem of anything. They will live a life of either completely or partially denying it. Then you have a small segment of people, well, I don't know, you have another segment of people who are going to admit a problem. I know I'm an alcoholic. I know I'm a hoarder. But that's as far as they'll go. They don't do anything. Then you have another segment of people who say, OK, I'll look for help. And maybe they look for help, but they never actually call the number. And <laughs> then you have a segment of people who call the number, but never follow through with it. I mean, it's, it's interesting. There's a whole thing called stages of change. There's a very small portion of people who will really engage in a therapeutic or change process. A very small percentage, relatively speaking. You may know this from your own personal life or people you know. It's kind of sad, but I, I'm trying to reach the people I can, so to speak. And then even the people who engage in change, it may be a lifelong journey. I mean, I'm a recovering shoplifter. I'm also recovering codependent. I also recognize I have a lot of other addictions. I can become a workaholic, a TVaholic. There's a lot of things I've got to keep an eye on. I, had a, a, uh, I was at a, a, a lecture recently for an addiction conference, and I never heard it said this way. <laughs> but the first thing, that, he was a very well-known doctor. He goes, our job as mental health therapists, as I see it, is to help people die with an addiction rather than from an addiction. <laughs> Meaning, you know, most people are kind of going to be in recovery a lifetime. And if they can still be working on it, that's sometimes the best we can do. But um, packaging material, newspapers, magazines, food. You guys heard of animal hoarding? You know, every now and then you hear something, a low, a low yeah. So here, here's a question. Um, so let's just use dogs. I'm, I'm more of a dog person. I love cats, but I tend to be a little allergic. How many dogs would a person have to have in order to be considered an animal hoarder or a dog or a pet hoarder? Five or more. Do I hear six, seven? It's a trick question. OK, now first of all, most cities have ordinances, whether we're aware or not, about how many animals you can have, unless you get a designation as a breeder or whatever, things like that. 
Um, so it's really not a number. Paris Hilton, I remember hearing about seven, eight years ago, had 29 dogs. You know, all, they're all the pocket dog, <laughs> they'll purse to know. And I remember, I, actually, I was uninformed because my first, oh, she's an animal hoarder, 29. And then I actually began to kind of, you know, study. It has nothing to do with the number. What does it have to do with? Yeah, generally what you will find with animal hoarders is, and they think they're often, they're often very caring people. They take in strays, somebody, you know, they don't want the dogs or the cats to die. I get it, I love animals. But it gets to a point where something goes on in the brain and often because they're maybe having interpersonal relationships, the animals become kind of their family. And then but it gets overwhelming, the place goes to heck in a handbag, their health is declining, maybe they can't afford to feed all these animals, the animals are getting sick, and that's typically the case you see when you read these articles or see them on the news. And if you think it's hard to take away inanimate objects from a hoarder, in a case like that where, where the house is condemned or the health department or police department or fire department, imagine taking these beings out. And they are, they're usually removed against the person's will. And then what do you think happens after that? They collect, <laughs> they collect more, generally speaking, because very few people get help. So that's a whole other thing I don't work with animal hoarding. Um, there's a lot of stuff here. We'll move on in the interest of time. Okay. So this list is just a partial list of all the different kinds of consequences that can happen to people with hoarding. Now, they don't all happen, but given enough time, uh, many of them will. <laughs> um, and it's really a list we could actually say for almost any kind of behavior. Like, here's some consequences of gambling addiction or gambling. Uh, here's a consequence of drug use or drug abuse. Here's a consequence of over shopping. So in other words, you're going to have relational issues, often financial issues, um, health and safety issues, both physical and mental health, negative effects on family members or children, again, relation. You may have legal issues, like the people I work with, shoplifting or stealing from work, typically legal issues, but hoarders can have legal issues. What kind of legal issues? What kind of legal issues can hoarders have in your imagination? Their house is condemned. Their house could be condemned, they could be evicted, yes. They could be given tickets for blight or odors or um, you're not cleaning up when they're told to clean up in a, in a safe way, the health department. How about um, Maybe they lose their bills? Lose their bills. They can, uh, there's some studies that show generally, not always, that people with hoarding problems often are late in their taxes or don't file taxes. They lose personal papers are important. They may be not paying their bills on time. They may overdraw their checking account, things like that. That's often common. Utilities, Utilities can be turned off. Child protective services can get involved because if the children are thought to be in danger in an unsafe home with a mentally ill parent, adult protective services can be involved. Um, divorce is often common, that's a legal issue. So all kinds of things. Personal liability, somebody comes in your home and they trip or something falls on them, all kinds of things. And really lost time, energy, and potential for living, which is everybody's choice how he or she wants to live. I'm not here to tell people what to do, but the, the, the terrible thing about addictions, mental illness, and, and, and hoarding is they really do, they take up so much of our time and energy, and the, the whole thing is we can't take it with us. Do I want to be remembered at the end of my life? Let's say I'm on my deathbed as, wow, boy, Terry sure had a lot of stuff. He was a great collector. Or, and this often happens when my, my uh, wife's um, father died in 2001. You know, it was not a very pleasant thing to have to deal with moving her mom out down the road and to have to go through all this and you know, rent two long metal dumpsters and go through the stuff and hire people. Not, I mean, you're always going to have a little bit of that moving. And then when her mom died uh, about nine years later in 2010, and she lived in a basically a studio apartment for senior living in St. Clair Shores, Macomb County. And I'll take her word for this. I went over and visited. It was pretty cluttered. But when her mom did finally die in her sleep, thankfully, um, God bless her soul, <laughs> uh, my wife and her older sister took out to the dumpster a hundred hefty garbage bags of stuff in this small little apartment. So actually, sometimes people come to me uh, because they, that's their wake-up call. You know, I'm getting close to death, and I thought my kids or my grandkids maybe wanted my treasures, but I'm getting the feeling that they don't, and I'm starting to realize that I can't take back what I've, what's already happened in time, but I'd like to be remembered as having tried to change and having given them the gift of, of my trying to get well. And, and, I, and I don't want them to have to deal with all this other stuff on top of my death and everything. I'd like to be as organized as possible. That, that can be a real gift for people. 
A little bit of a mouthful, but here's the official kind of definition of hoarding according to the Diagnostical Statistical Manual of Psychological Disorders. We are now in version five as of uh, 2013, and uh, there's five different versions, and it started about 100 years ago, and about every 15 to 20 years they update it, and hoarding finally made the cut. Up until then, it was listed as a symptom of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and it is different, but a lot of people have both. My brother has both classic OCD and hoarding, but it, it can be different, and, or it was a, a symptom of anxiety disorders because people often, when they're being forced to give up their stuff or they're even thinking about doing it, they get a lot of anxiety, and I witnessed this with my brother. But um, a persistent difficulty discarding or parting with personal possessions, even those of apparent useless or limited value. Aye, but that's the rub. Who's to say what is trash and what is treasure? And that's where we get into trouble. But if I'm an anorexic looking in the mirror, what am I seeing as an anorexic? What's my, what's my distorted thinking? I, I'm seeing a person who's overweight. It's like looking in a funhouse mirror. My perception's distorted. Everybody else is saying, you're a skeleton. Same thing with hoarding. Oh, no, I need that. No, that's going to be useful. I need, and then you, you never make any decisions, and, and, and the family's pulling their hair out. Sometimes we're pulling our own hair out if we have this problem. That's the distortion of thinking. At some point, and I know it's a tough call to say you know, what people should keep. It's not ultimately for me to say, but I help people really figure that out. And what's the goal? What's the gift of actually breaking through this? Because this is really costing a lot of time, energy, and heartache. Um, strong urges to save, distress and indecision about discarding, so it's a double whammy. I get a little bit of a higher rush when I bring something in, and then I've probably had the experience of letting something go and then thinking, oh, I could have used that. You know, I don't want to feel that. And then guess what? You know, somebody says, hey, you don't happen to have still that thing like from about 19 years ago. Well, as a matter of fact, I do, and I dig it out, and I get a little positive reinforcement for not having thrown it out. And I've seen that with my brother, because my nephew sometimes will say, and, and my nephew's sensitive to his father having mental illness and hoarding, but every now and then I'll say, Dad, do we still have that board game I used to have? And yeah, I got it. <laughs> so, you know, you, you get that too. No wonder, you know, he's gotten well, but, you know, he still struggles a little bit. Large number of things that tend to spill up the, act, fill up, sorry, the active living area. Home, workplace. Now, there's some people who are cluttered or hoarding or, in every dimension of their life, but sometimes there are people you'd least expect. Their office, if they're at work, might be, their car might be fine, but there are people who hoard in their cars, like they're almost living out of them, and that's dangerous because it can block your vision, it can weigh the car down where you hit bumps or things, and, um, uh, and even the office vehicle and yard. And then, you know, as somebody said earlier, they, they tend to cause significant distress and impairment in your social life, your work life, and or other important areas of your life, even health and safety. Again, I could be in denial about that. So again, we, we said maybe 2 to 5%. I'm going to show you a film in a minute. Um, we're not going to show every slide. If you want a copy of this PowerPoint, um, you can email me and I'll email it to you. I only ask that you kind of keep it to yourself for the most part or share it only with select people. Don't distribute it far and wide uh, if you would. Um, we're not going to, I'm just going to move on to a couple more slides here and then I want to start showing the film here. Here's a good one. Um, so difference between chronic disorganization and hoarding, as we were talking about, chronic disorganization, unable to decide. Hoarding, unwilling. Do you get the difference? There's an obstinance there. Worried about potential need for items, yes. Well, hoarders do that too, but, they're, but it, it's, more, um, it's more distorted and, and exaggerated. Like my brother, when he finally tried to sell some things on eBay and Craigslist, like some, some old toys of my, bro, uh, my nephews or action figures that were not, he thought he'd be a millionaire that I got all these things that are in perfect shape. They've never been taken out of the box. Oh, this is a clip. He goes on Craigslist and eBay to see if he could sell them a few years ago. And what does he find? He finds that everybody else is selling that kind of stuff. He, he can't even recoup the original cost of the item, you know. So there's the, all that. Unintentional churning, meaning, you know, you're trying to move things, but you can't. That's where you might need help or a professional organizer. Often with hoarding, it's deceptive. As a matter of fact, those storage units come in handy because a lot of times, guess how, what, honey? I cleaned up all my stuff. What? Well, God, God, it looks great. Three years later, you get the bill in the mail, and you see that your partner actually has been renting a storage unit down the road. That's where the hoard went. I mean, that actually happens. Embarrassment and shame, or you know, yeah, sometimes with hoarding, but more defensive and paranoid. It's a whole different animal. All right, just a couple more here. Um, one to five is sometimes the scale we use. One being the most mild. 
five being the ones that you typically see on TV, high fours, five. Here's a great little uh, image here of a bedroom. Now, how many have a bedroom that is best represented by number one, frame number one? Okay, we'll come back and do the one on OCD next month. That'll be for you guys. <laughs> That's the Martha Stewart syndrome. That's what her prison cell looked like, remember? I'm, I'm good. Uh, I know there should be a slide 1.5, but the, the funny thing about this, so when I work with people long distance, if, if, if they don't, if they're not working me, with me by Skype or FaceTime where they can move the, the camera or the phone so I can actually see in real time what it looks like, because they might actually say, I, I can show them this, I could email them the slide, and they might, I might say, what does your bedroom look like? And they go, oh, it's about like a two or a three. And I said, do you mind if you, can you, can you take a photograph and show me, or can we do it live on the camera where I can move around and show me? And, and very often they've underrepresented. And they really mean it because they get used to it. And, and really, to me, it might be more of a five or a six. Or you get a couple in, and you use the slide because maybe you're not in their home or whatever. You know, maybe they don't want you in your home. Sometimes I go to people's home, and you know. So let's say the husband's the hoarder, and uh, you know, I ask him, okay, you're in the bedroom. I hear the bedroom is a problem, according to your wife, sir. Uh, what does your bedroom look like? What, roughly, which one? And he'll go, oh, well, maybe it's about a four. And what do you think the wife says? Nine. Yeah, she'll say a nine, <laughs> or an eight, or a seven. And I don't know what the reality is, but it's safe to say that couples will often perceive things differently. And they'll blame each other because the one who may have the hoarding issue might have half a point. So it's, my wife is Martha Stewart. She's a neat nick. I can't. So, well, and then I have to often work with the family and say, ma'am or sir, you're going to have to, you're gonna ha we might have to work with a compromise here. Um, and, and we try to take baby steps here. Another, here's an example of a kitchen. Again, I assume if the bedroom was nice, your kitchen must be a one-two. All you who raised your hands over there on this side of the room. Oh, no, I'm kidding you. It's fine if you want to clean. If you want to eat off the floor, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, it, and it, it usually is a gradual thing. And, um, and then one with the living room here. Now, are these real pictures? Or are these no, they're staged. They're staged. But they're, you know, but, but, you know, no, they're, they're staged for effect. But sometimes they're helpful. And, and often when people are watching these TV programs, sometimes the, the, both the family or the hoarder is woken up when they see a representation of what they're going through. Just like when we watch movies and we're moved by them. Oh my God, I've gone through that in my relationship. I, I'm moved by it. Sometimes it's a wake-up call. The, the challenge with those programs is because they always show the, the fives, the, from the one to five scale, the seven, eights, or nines, somebody who has even a mild hoarding in four, five, or six might say, oh, well, I don't have a problem. Thank God, I thought I had a problem. That's a problem. <laughs> you know. Or even the family member might say, oh, thank God. You know. It doesn't have to be like that to be interfering with your relationships, with the way your kids feel, with health and safety, you know, or even people wanting to come over. Or even if you want people to come over, they don't want to come over. There's a lot of different things. So, all right, we're going to, any quick questions before we show our video? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, there can there be. Are certain rooms that yeah. Are yeah, and, and, and those are the ones that I actually like to work with. In many cases, it is not the whole house. Yeah. It can get to that, be, but in many So that's often what people say well, my whole house isn't. Great. That's good news. And, I was like, and let's start with the problem areas, or at least what your wife feels are the problem areas, or what you kind of acknowledge are problem areas. Great, I'm glad your whole house is not a condemned area, but, but, but be careful. And it's going to take more than shifting things around, because sometimes people will do that, they'll just move it from one, that's an improvement, moving it to the basement, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hip to that, but then can we go to the next step? And why would we want to? And it still might be a relational issue, in the case with the, uh, the couple whose uh, basement was she wanted the basement cleared in part because there's sometimes uh, severe weather. She didn't want it all flooded and have to deal with that. Sometimes there's tornado warnings. She wanted to be go able to go down there and not have to squeeze in. You know, they might have to be down there for a couple hours. They might want to have a cup of tea. She can't do it down there. You know, so a lot of stuff. Now, you're going to love this video, okay? And I know a couple of you have to leave early, but I hope you can stay roughly 20 minutes for this video because it's going to knock your socks off. It's both entertaining and informative, or I should say informative and entertaining. It's called, let's see if I can get this here. Oh, let me just move it down here. Where's that cursor? Okay, here. It's called <coughs> Stuffed. 
and it is available on Amazon uh, to either rent or to purchase. I can't find it in video or any other kind of download, but it came out about 10 years ago, but it's still a really good film, and then we'll discuss it after a bit and wind down a little bit, because it will talk about the, um, what, what, what hoarding is, what causes it, and some of the treatment. Inside the building. 
It was the home of Langley and Homer Collier, two wealthy and inclusive brothers known as the Hermits of Harlem. The Colliers lived completely cut off from the outside world, without heat, electricity, or human contact. Altogether, the mansion contained 136 tons of junk, and it was rigged with booby traps to protect the whole. Among the brothers' stuff were thousands of books and the chassis of their father's Model T Ford. For years, Langley had cared for his brother, who had grown blind and paralyzed. Langley saved thousands of newspapers for Homer to read in case he regained his sight. Workman found Homer's body right away. He had died of malnutrition. The hunt for Langley's body lasted weeks. Finally, they found him a few feet from where his brother had died. He had been crushed under a pile of stuff. I just feel that things are just more reliable than people. They're, like there's a certain comfort I have with my stuff. Well, of course, this kind of almost like ghetto mentality about food. We're taught about the Holocaust and you know, it might not be enough. So to see that we weren't allowed to eat the canned food in our houses, that was for an emergency like war. Yeah, and this was Connecticut in the 70s. I was sent away to camp every summer. And I came back one summer, and all of my toys, all of my doll collection um, was gone. When I um, asked my grandmother you know, why she did it, she said I had too many toys. Basically, I was just first year in high school, and I I started acquiring LP, record LPs, and I really liked my LP collection, and I really liked music. And then when it was time to move, it was like, well, LPs are really heavy, you can't handle those. They have your 20 favorite, and that's all you can handle. Now my family was uh, not a very comfortable place to live. It was violent, and uh, nobody really trusted each other, and so like, our stuff was kind of, that was, that was our area of comfort. And at one point, we moved everything to storage because we didn't know how long we were going to be here. And then the storage burned out. I think that a lot of hoarders think they're collectors. But I think that real collectors want to have an order to their collection. Now, I have no idea. Um, how many dolls I actually have. There's so many. I think I might have around a thousand, but I've lost count. Uh, he's in his evening clothes. And he has come to the whole array of costumes, costumes, um, clothing. Yeah, to my 
reaction. long been considered a symptom of obsessive compulsive disorder, but researchers now believe that it may be a separate, neurologically distinct condition. We had observed a very interesting phenomenon in a couple of our patients. Dr. Anderson and his colleagues studied a rare group of porters who started collecting after strokes, brain tumors, and blows to the head. The injuries had one thing in common. They all occurred in the area of the brain called the mesial prefrontal cortex. It's part of the brain that we do not understand very well. It's part of the brain that's very involved in emotional behavior, social behavior. Most orders don't have brain damage, but it turns out they show low activity in a very similar area of the brain. And these areas right here in white show areas that had lower brain metabolism, lower brain activity, and compulsive orders as compared to normal controls. This posterior part of the simulant gyrus is involved in mediating visual spatial activity and memory and emotional processes. This area of the brain appears to regulate the primal urge to collect in humans, steering it into socially acceptable forms. 
in compulsive quarters, this mechanism doesn't work properly. And the drive to collect runs unchecked while the clutter piles up. I'm sure you've heard of advertising from those toys lens. So that's a big thing in the American culture is to consume and collect and get more and get more. They never tell you where you're going to put it once you get it bought. I realized it was a problem for me when health inspectors were coming. And I just about died. The health inspector showed up, and what they said was, wow, you have a lot of stuff. That's exactly what they said. And I'm like, yeah. And since a lot of it's hanging from the ceiling, they said, well, you put it up there, if there's an earthquake, and all the stuff falls on your head, it's your own fault. That's when I sort of realized that I should seek help and start looking into what's involved in the behaviors I'm going through and, and try and do something to help. I keep watching the program and these professional organizers come in and help people. In a matter of you know, days, the apartments are fantastic and they come in and paint for them and give them new furniture and you know, $3,000 for the place for all that. <laughs> And I keep watching, I keep looking at the that it could be me. Once it gets to a bad place, it's almost impossible to. You have to start out like that and keep it like that. My name is food. Because that way we can consume without collecting. Well, this is a list of things that I have in the cabinet. So A, I won't double buy any of this, and no one is actually in there. So I tack this right up here next to this kitchen cabinet, and uh, I need to know what's in there. I just go to my list and check it out. I set a timer for 30 minutes. I'll say, for 30 minutes, I'm going to go through this stack of magazines, pull out all the articles I want, throw away the rest. I took an interest in setting compulsive warnings because I could recognize the face of myself. Because about seven or eight years ago, I hadn't heard it in the newspapers anymore. I went through and realized that I had to start getting rid of them and that nothing terrible was going to happen if I didn't get a chance to read you know, the, the Time magazine for three months ago. If I have to get it in and out of the bathroom, it just wheels really feebly, and I can just do it in the bathroom. Of course, there's um, um, the bathroom cleaner in the way right now. <laughs> As opposed to before, when I, um, before I went to the storage room, there were also chairs and other things I had to move before I could get in and out of my um, front door.
that's that. And um, we're going to discuss this a bit here. Let's see, from current slide. Okay. Now, whoop. Okay, we'll go backwards on that. Okay, I turn that back on, and the clicker is here. Um, I went away for a bit and had a little relapse at your uh, little bookstore here. I bought some <laughs> stuff that I now have in a bag that I have to uh, s sneak in or my wife's going to kill me. Fortunately, I think I'm going to get home about five minutes earlier than she is. No. While we're, uh, let's talk about the uh, video, and I, I meant to uh, email um, Debbie um, something, which I'm going to try to do without distracting you, um, a, a form with all my upcoming talks on it that she might have copies for by the time. So I, I am paying attention, but I had to find the email. So. What did you guys think of it? Was that, I, I heard some laughter. I was down the hall, but I did hear it, and there's some funny parts, but there's some poignant parts and sensitive parts. I think it's a very good, uh, you know, initial intro to hoarding. Did anybody have any thoughts or questions about it? I thought the part about the brain was the best, where they showed the brain and talked about the brain. And, and, and how did that help you, sir? Like, what did that? Just to try to understand what's going on in the brain. Yeah. And we're still in the early stages of that. Um, we don't know for sure whether it's um, a totally organic thing or thing, the way we learn changes the brain. Obviously, they had that little clip where for some people, if there's a stroke, a tumor, or head trauma in that certain area of the brain, they begin hoarding. There might be low activity. They've done some of those studies. Again, as they said, it doesn't mean that everybody has something like that going on in their brains. but. Um, but if we know about the brains, the more we do something, it does change the neuronal pathways and the circuitry of the brain, just like with gambling addiction or even with drugs and alcohol. So it, it is something to keep in mind. What else about the, uh, about the video did you, did you find interesting or helpful? When the woman says she doesn't think she can pull a lot more Maria. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great line, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, and that, and, and that's real, right? I'm not a full-blown alcoholic or, you know, I, I'm not 400 pounds, I'm only 350, or I'm not, you know, I, I, I still have uh, a little money left on my Visa card. Um, it, it, and, and we all can do that. You know, I, I can say that about the TV. Oh, you know, during the whole political thing, you know, the whole year and a half, I was watching about three to four hours of TV a night while doing stuff on my computer and catching up on reading articles and odds and ends, but I was just totally hooked into, you know, and, and in my mind, you know, I hear, well, the average person watches six hours, so I'm like, well, I'm only watching four. <laughs> and, and my wife was like, ugh, you know. So it, we, we are curious creatures, all of us. What else about the video? Yes. I don't think that anyone ever sees themselves as they really are. Mm-hmm. Well, we adapt. We adapt, right? So if people get overweight, they buy different clothing, or they figure out ways to, you know, live on the first floor and not go up the steps, or, you know, you're out of money because you're a gambler, you're a spendaholic. Well, <laughs> I'll find ways to adapt, or, you know, or if I don't want to get behind the wheel of a car because I'm drunk, I've got Uber now, you know? So it, it's interesting. Yeah, you're right. Yes. That, you know, your life can be made much easier. You know, the, the, yes. the two guys that were in Harlem there, you know, I mean, they never even the Collier saw brothers. to ask for help. Right, yeah, that's an amazing and, story, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh. Right. You know, how does it get to that point? Yeah. Do you mind if I ask your first name? Connie. Connie? Now, you were one of the handful of people who self-identified when I asked earlier, is there anybody here who has thought maybe previously or currently that you've had an issue with hoarding behavior? And you, can I ask you if you, you don't have to share, I'm not asking for a whole life story, but um, how long have you suspected or thought that you've had some uh, symptoms of hoarding? Uh, presently, I have four households in my household, which would be my parents, my okay. Okay. So watching something like this helps me. Okay. That my parents, I moved from Pittsburgh to my house in okay. 1991, and I haven't opened any of the boxes. Okay. So, so, it, I, so it, I need to, you know, deal with. Okay. 
So no, it, it, it was an attachment. I don't have an attachment anymore. Okay. So part of it sounded situational. So there is a move. And sometimes when you move to a smaller environment or now you're moving with other people in the home. So again, that can almost just visually begin to look like hoarding. And then you have other people's stuff you have to contend with, correct? Well, but but you, you self-identify with I mean, some that's, features that's of it. The reason why for my inactivity is that, you know, I, I'm like blaming. You know, instead oh, of, okay, instead you bl of, yes, instead of, instead of getting rid of all my parents' stuff when they died, which we should have done. I oh, oh, okay, got it, yeah. My ex-husband's stuff ended up in my house because he moved to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, my yeah. daughter graduated yeah. college. Yeah. And I'm going to put this away. So, yeah. I mean, I use it for an excuse. I say, oh, that's their thing. You know, it doesn't right. have anything to do with me. Whereas if I had just taken care yeah. of it at the time it, it happened, yeah, that's I wouldn't a, be in the position I'm in now. Yeah. I had um, a 30 foot dumpster on my driveway. Okay. And I filled it. Wow. And today I could do it again. While we're talking, I'm going to flash you some of these slides. I know we're at about the uh, 3.30 hours, so if some of you need to leave. I'm going to go a few more minutes because uh, we started a little late and you guys are such a good crowd. If you need to leave, fine. Um, I'm not going to be able to get you that uh, little thing. So if you want the list of uh, my upcoming talks, if you want to attend one or you have a loved one, please email or call me and I will email it or mail it to you because uh, there's about 20 coming up between now and, uh, now and June. I, I was dealing with a, um, a woman who... Um, in um, Allendale near Grand Rapids just a few weeks ago uh, and she was talking about how her husband's a professor and he hit all of his books have basically taken over their beautiful upstairs library it's cherry wood cabinets and and I'm like you know not blaming the victim so to speak but saying well what keeps you well he's expecting me to do it I said well that's a bummer you know he ought to you know move his own stuff I know he's busy but at some point, you can complain, or you might have to actually just say, okay, well, I'm going to do it because I want my library back. It may not be fair that he's not, he says he doesn't have the time to help or whatever, uh, but, but, you know, let's sometimes do what we can do. Anything else about the, the whole topic today as I'm going through some of these? I mean, you have to think of the psychology of, of how people get to the point where they actually feel this way, you know. Um, but anything more about the film or... Um, uh, this slide is iffy because there's really anybody can be a hoarder, but what we often see anyway in the mental health profession is people are usually about in their 50s as a rough average before they will get help. Some far earlier, some far later, but generally in their 50s because often that's enough years or decades worth of the problem that they, they start to, and re, this is a very small subset of people who will even get help, remember, but they, they're usually kind of in their 50s. And, you know, um, here's some uh, misconceptions. Again, trying to remove the shame and stigma. I mean, just like we had the I whole idea of what is a drunk, you know, an alcoholic, you know, skid row bum, or, you know, or what's a crack addict? You know, it could be anybody. Uh, you know, what's a sex addict? What's whatever? You, you know, we have these preconceptions, which is normal, but a lot of times, you know, until it hits home for ourselves or our loved ones, we go, oh my God, wait a minute, this this is hitting home. This could be anybody. Um, you know, if it were just about the stuff. The stuff is a representation, just like it's not just about the food, it's not just about the booze, what's really going on. And even if you clean up the stuff or move it out voluntarily or involuntarily, that's not healing. That's not necessarily healing. It's an improvement, but it's likely to be temporary. Or sometimes people will switch behaviors. Okay, I've stopped suddenly drinking, but I've picked up gambling. <laughs> or I've stopped smoking, but now I'm eating. Um, or even with the bariatric surgeries that are, uh, you know, been, been going on in the last decade or more, those can be lifesavers for people, and they're very good, but you have to also deal with the psychology of the person. Very often, people who go through bariatric surgery end up actually switching addictions, and now they become alcoholics because they're craving the sugar, but the alcohol has fewer calories and is more of a liquid, but they're, they're becoming alcoholics, or they just don't know how to live a different life, and it's all kinds of, they thought, oh, this is going to be perfect, but no, they get, there still might be core issues. Um, again, another picture here. Oh, I'm not doing that one. Um, so we, they went over a few of the theories. It's really, again, we're, even though hoarding's been going on from the dawn of time, we've really only been looking at it for about 20 years in a serious fashion, really more in the last 10 years since those programs have been popping up. And I'm not sure who got the idea for that first program. Hey, let's do something about hoarding. Maybe it was somebody who had a family member. And, and, but it's just really, those programs are really popular. So whether you're a hoarder or not, just our attachment to stuff, and I'm not anti-stuff, but, you know, our relationship to stuff. There's three epidemics. Well, there's actually many epidemics going on. One is there's an obesity epidemic. 
So our relationship to food and eating is really going through a lot of shifts, and there's a lot of reasons why that's happening. Our relationship to money, so now there's a lot more credit cards and spending and debt and bankruptcies. That's been in the last 20, 30 years, and even starting with young people, you know, and then with stuff. So bigger homes, more stuff, more access to stuff. You can, you know, with the punch of a button, you can have your stuff delivered in 24 hours. You know, all, and then the storage unit industry. So now, obviously, with prescription pills, there's a lot of abuse. With the internet itself, there's a lot of new problems. People can gamble online. They can get sex online. They can play video games online. They can just surf the internet all day long. So, the, you know, there's a lot of things going on. And, you know, it, it, it takes a little pause in our lives sometimes to say, is this my life I'm living or what is really going on? And, and, and I'm not here to tell anybody to do anything, but you know, if this can get you thinking a little bit about your relationship with stuff, and often especially what we're teaching our children. I'm not a, I'm not a parent, but probably one of the most difficult things about parenting is trying to figure out you know, that sweet spot between not having your kids feel deprived but not overindulging them either and letting them know there's more than just stuff. You know, we just went through the holidays. We talked about the commercialization of the, the holiday season and things like that. So again, different theories. If any of these ring a bell to you, and some of these are fleshed out with stories in my book. We're not going to talk about animal hoarding, but, um, you know, again, harm reduction, you know, is sometimes just our foot in the door. Even for a person who may have a hoarding problem, just sometimes they might actually say, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of tripping over this stuff. I got to do something. So sometimes it, it happens. Always empathy. So even with your family members, if you're frustrated and you want to pull your hair out or whatever, you have to slow down. Apologize maybe and just say, look, I just love you and I care about you. I am concerned. If you're interested, I went to this talk with this strange guy from Detroit <laughs> at the Celine Library. <laughs> and, 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 you know, here's a conversation starter. If you're interested, here's a book. Or maybe you want to check out this website. Or just tell me what it's like for you. Or how can I be of help? Um, and, you know, some of these are good for just a chronically disorganized person. But after we get through a little bit of the meat and the potatoes of some of the core issues that are going on in a hoarder's life, some of these can use. My favorite is just the five-minute timer. You know, where you just put on, you know, set your clock or whatever, just for five minutes, see if you can do something. Or even while you're watching TV, and, or maybe you invite a friend over for coaching or support or company. Um, there's all kinds of things. Whoop. I don't know, there was supposed to be one more slide, I think. Oh, there, okay. Um, anything you can do to help? Oh, you guys are in Washtenaw County, aren't you? Yeah. So have you heard of the Washtenaw County Hoarding Task Force? No? Oh, they are one of the longest running and most competent and involved task forces in the U.S. So if nothing more, if you have any questions, whether you are a hoarder, you know a hoarder, you want some information, the Washtenaw County Hoarding Task Force. Look it up. They've got a website, I believe, and a phone number. And I've met a few of the people. And they, they've been, I think they've been together like 10 or 15 years. And they just do, they, they educate, they provide information and resources, and they do have some volunteers who can help. Sometimes what happens is people may be uh, financially uh, challenged to even be able to pay for therapy, or let's say they're ready to have things moved. Can they do it all? They might be uh, older adults, or they can't actually do the heavy lifting or moving out of the stuff. The hoarding task force might have some referrals who can do it either for free or low cost. So, We've gone a little over, and this was only 101, but I hope you have learned something today. Let's give ourselves a hand.